they allege they were exposed to the coronavirus as a result of gross negligence by the company. Uh, the complaint notes that before the trip from San Francisco to Hawaii, as you recall, that's where it was going, at least one. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> good morning, Vincent. Good morning. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> how's everybody doing? Good morning, Dr. Terrell. Good morning, Hope. <laughs> Sleepy. Oh, me too. I went to bed early last night, but I could not sleep. I just, uh, I don't know. I feel like I, I'm still in bed. Well, let's talk about you guys today, maybe things will perk up a little bit. One weird thing about you guys is, is that <clears throat> a lot of the important concepts are <clears throat> embedded within just a simple block diagram where you have, um, oops, let me erase this thing. you have a um, source a QVAT, right, a sample and in line, actually in a physical line with this you have the monochromator Got a detector, and you got a PC, you know, for data processing. And um, so, uh, you know, it's it's fairly straightforward from that perspective. Let's look at some of the details. Uh, for example, the uh, the source. Uh, very commonly contains a deuterium lamp. If you want ultraviolet, right? And um, <clears throat> the deuter deuterium lamps have um, a continuum of ultraviolet, which is a little bit unusual. Um, that's because um, basically you, you're making a bunch of states in the D2 population. And a lot of them can fall apart or recombine, basically. And what that means is that they're summing in some kinetic energy to the production of a photon. And that means that the, the photon uh, energies can come on a continuum. So if they were atomic, then, you know, just the atom, it would just, it would create a line spectrum. You can broaden it, um, but you can't really make a continuum, but with D2 or H2 or HD, you can make a continuum. And I don't really know why, you know, I think I don't really know why they don't use nitrogen or other things. I think H2 just it, um, makes a good spectrum. So and then that, that's how you cover the UV. Then to get to the, um, uh, Near infrared, use quartz tungsten halogen. 
I absolutely love the fact that many of you are literally too young to remember when a light bulb was was a they were all tungsten halogens. You know, they were all just glass or tungsten or or um, uh, quartz envelopes with a wire in the middle that was coiled up, you know, and that's how they all work. <laughs> and, um, you know, they heat them up to about 2,500 degrees Kelvin and they glow and a uh, typical operating temperature will put them, you know, uh, will make them slightly yellow. And then they fill them with a halogen that helps to redeposit the, um, the tungsten that evaporates back onto the filaments. I don't know exactly how that works, but um, uh, so, uh, so you got um, typical uh, UV vis light source will contain both a D2 and a coarse tungsten halogen lamp. And they'll, they'll use a beam splitter and they'll typically have to turn down the intensity of the uh, QTH lamp uh, to match the, more or less match the intensity profile with the um, deuterium lamp. Um, also, you can get ultraviolet from a xenon or a mercury arc lamp, and um, you know you can uh, you can cover the two hundred thousand, two hundred to one thousand nanometer range, and it's very spiky. It's a continuum plus line, and uh, you know uh, xenon is. Um, it was popular in uh, luxury car headlamps for a while. It, it's very blue and it's very blinding to be honest also, or I think to be honest, but um, xenon and then mercury we're all familiar with and sometimes combinations thereof. And, um, and they make good, very good UV resources too. And they're a little bit more expensive than the D2 um, uh, uh, QTH combinations are probably a little bit less robust in the visible and the near infrared. But anyway, um, and then the materials um, that are used are silica, which is transparent in the 190 to 2500 nanometer range, right? Um, glass, which is transparent in the 350 to 1500 nanometer range. And then if you want to get fancy, you can use sapphire. Sapphire is a fancy name for aluminum oxide. And that is transparent a little farther into the UV and significantly farther into the, into, actually into the mid infrared there, up to 5,500 uh, 5, nanometers. 5,500 nanometers is about, um, one over five is about 0.2, that's about 2,000 wave numbers. So that's, um, so you can catch the CH stretching modes through Sapphire. I'll put another parenthesis in there and let's say about 2,000 wave numbers there. And it's a little expensive, it's true. Although it's not as expensive as it used to be. So, um, okay, so now uh, there's a quick review of the uh, sources and the instruments, and that's all we're gonna say about them. Um, now let's talk about the instrument configurations. Um, the one that I uh, diagrammed before in a little bit more uh, detail here has a source as a filter or monochromator. A filter or photometer um, is usually just a single purpose thing. Um, uh, you know, maybe for measuring uh, blood alcohol or, you know, some, you know, uh, maybe some bioassay or something. And it's just designed to admit a certain wavelength through that can uh, screen for a particular dye that's being um, uh, turned on or off by this uh, chemical process. Um, and, uh, but if you use a, uh, uh, an 
instrument like we're describing, you'll have a source micrometer, you probably have a shutter, and then you'll have a reference cell and a sample cell. And you, and, you know, a lot of times it's just, it's just a, and then you, and you can just put them in one, one at a time. And then you have a detector, an amplifier, readout, computer, da da da. And then um, they're simple, relatively inexpensive design. And, uh, and um, that's what, um, that's, these are the advantage of them. Disadvantages are that if there's any drift in the source or detector between, um, P zero and P measurements, then that's a problem. Um, so that, you know, like if you have, like let's say we're measuring a blank and a blank, right? And the, the light power, you know, you're measuring water versus water, for example, and one of them is P zero, one of them is P, and you should get zero absorbance, but if the light power drifts down, so P is less than P zero, then you'll get a positive absorbance, or you know you get get a negative absorbance too. And so that that's a, a source of noise, you know, and that will you know basically gives absorbance error. So um, the alternative to that is to use a, a double beam instrument, and here's one way to do a double beam. Let's use a beam splitter. And then um, you have a reference cell and a sample cell there. Actually, at some point, you'll probably have two reference cells and you'll balance the detectors. And you'll replace the reference with the sample. And then the difference amplifier there will tell you, well, can be converted into absorbance. The difference amplifier hopefully is giving you the ratio of the light power that comes in in channel two versus one. And that ratio then can be. Um, log and take the log of that value, then you get a readout. So, um, and uh, these are advantageous because they're um, almost simultaneous um, and they're more accurate, uh, but they're a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit more complicated. They, they may require two detectors or they might require some chopping options. Now that, the chopping approach to combining beams uses um, a set of spinning mirrors here. The spinning mirrors, what they do is, I mean, it's, it seems a little antiquated, but it still works well. And it's a way of modulating the uh, signal from the source so that you can, um, Compensate for drift and also lock onto the signal very accurately. So um, here, uh, let's let me see if I can dress this up a little bit. Here's a mirror one. There's a mirror two, and there's they're spinning and syn synchronizes, spinning and synchronized. And at every period here, um, the beam comes out and then goes through a blank and then uh, and it rejoins, the, uh, it rejoins the main path here. And so you've got blank and then sample and then blank and then sample, for example. And what this, what this does is it allows you to um, uh, compensate for other frequencies of noise, for example. And what I have here, what I'm, what I'm trying to illustrate here in this figure um, on the lower left here is the idea that um, this could be blank, and this could be sample, right? And, um, uh, or it could be, um, actually, I realize there's a little bit of a defect here in the way I did this. So let me, um, yeah, didn't see that one coming. This is actually for 
slightly different design. But um, uh, so let's see here. Yeah, well, anyhow, let's just do it like this. So there's blank and then there's sample. What you can do is you can, you can focus on the amplitude of the two signals, right? And, and you can cancel this slower drift. And you'll still you and you're going to average over this period tau, but then you're going to cancel uh, this this we'll call it tau pink. Pink noise is low frequency noise, so um, you can. Uh, average over a short period and then get many multiples of that average. And then, uh, then you can also, um, and then you can cancel the pink noise, which is this longer period noise. The longer period noise is, um, period is like, you know, it's like, in this case, it's maybe one second. And then average over tau, this is maybe 100 milliseconds. Although typically they'll be much shorter, they'll be short, like, um, like uh, one millisecond or, or less because the, um, the uh, chopper speeds can get pretty high. Hey, so Dr. Carroll, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. So when you're, <clears throat> if you're, Source hits the mirror and then goes through the blank. Do, do you have to compensate for the mirror or is it just um, yeah. the yeah. okay? Absolutely you do. And um so it's uh <laughs> the idea here is that you can do that better than you can stabilize a source, right? So what, if you if you can if you can divert this beam, head it through the blank, and then divert it back into into line with the with the um, uh, signal, and that process involves less noise pickup than is normally produced by the source in some flicker that the source might have, then you win. Right? Then you then you have locked on. And you can lock onto this signal, this high frequency signal. And then that lock in, you, you put it through um, uh, an analog amplifier called the lock in amplifier. And that amplifier can then produce a very clean signal that um, represents only the part of this that's, being, that's modulating at this high frequency. Does that make sense that, um, let me take a quick poll here and just see how dramatically horribly I'm doing. <clears throat> uh, I don't know how to use polls. <laughs> I'm gonna add a question. Oh, wow, I've never done this before. Add a question, okay, okay. All right, okay, enter a title. Chopping, and then Oh, and I'll, I'll make it anonymous if you guys want. So maybe some people will actually answer. Um, does it make sense that chopping cancels low frequency noise? Yes and no. Okay, can you guys see the uh, the poll? Uh, I don't see it. Ah, launch polling. Maybe I should launch poll. Can you guys see it? I see it. Okay. Yeah, All right. So that. one yes. This is a, another name for this poll. Is should I stop beating this stupid dead horse and move on? <laughs> I love it. The answers are coming in. Oh my God. Okay. 
17. Oh my God, oh my God, 18. Catherine, what's up? Oh, can you explain it again? <laughs> <laughs> sure, I can, sure. I, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's pretty, um, so what we have to, this is the yes crowd is split about 50-50 between people who didn't get it or want me to move the hell on and people who did get it. The no crowd or definitely didn't get it. And I don't lying. if I spend my, <laughs> that's right, that's right, that's right. It's um, uh, liars down liars and statisticians. Um, so, um, so uh, who wants to, um, uh, who wants to explain to Catherine why doing it this way will cancel this flicker noise or this pink noise and it will preserve the amplitude of the signal which is going vertically. Who's someone who answered, someone who answered yes, hopefully. Zero volunteers. <clears throat> okay, so um, let me put it in the form of a question. What if the signal were the size of this bump at any given time, right? And this is what you need to know is the size of this bump. But if you just measure it continuously, then somehow the bottom of this guy, like if you measure it uh, continuously, then you're gonna measure over uh, this interval and this interval and this interval. But if you use a lock-in amplifier and you chop the signal, then you'll get this signal out, this very clean two, one, two, right? Instead of two, one, two. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, good. And we know Catherine never lies. Nope. Nope, oh, there we go. That's good. That's good. Oh, that is such a tough self-discovery when you realize that you're a liar. I, 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 I am still struggling with that so much. Okay. Here's an example. You lie to yourself. Oh, oh, myself, everybody, you know, oh, oh, don't, let's not even go there. Why? Oh, because it's convenient. It helps my little narrative, whatever. Yeah, I do my best, but I'm a liar. I'm a big fat liar. You guys have to catch me. So um, here's a photodiode array, a charge couple device, multi-channel circuitry, right? Um, well, can't have photodiode array and a charge couple device. See, I lied again. See, um, the photodiode array here. Um, oh, and here's a cool design for a monochromator, right? You have a lamp and you collimate this lamp, right? You go through your cell. Why do they need a lens if it's already collimated? That's stupid. And then, well, the lens should actually focus it through the slit, right? Then it will, it expands out. Then the grating here, because it's a grating, will actually send different wavelengths off at different angles, right? And then every pixel in this will have a different wavelength. So the larger deviation corresponds to the longer wavelength, I think. So maybe it's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, ultraviolet. 
that type of thing. And um, this is a real popular kind of a, um, a spectrometer. And I love them. And I used them blithely for many years. Um, actually, I used a, I used a, a quartz tungsten halogen source. So they were just all basically no ultraviolet. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, the, um, so the, the advantage of this is that they are fast. Once you, once you record a blank spectrum here, you can get a spectrum every, you know, every 20 milliseconds, you know, so you get 50 spectra per second, you know. Or, or faster, you know, there's there's way, ways to do it really fast. You need a flash lamp, stuff like that, I don't know. But, um, you know, but you can get spectra really, really quickly. So um, uh, the disadvantage um, is that, um, uh, uh, they're a little bit limited in photometric accuracy. And an important one here is that single beam, it gives your specimen sunburn, right? So let's say, um, let's just say, for example, that, um, you're illuminating all across from say 200 to 800 nanometers, right? But your, your um, specimen absorbs strongly at 200 and it starts to decompose. And that's not uh, photo decomposition is, you know, it's actually a real thing. And so what you could find is that um, over time, the absorbent spectrum decays. Whereas if you just put red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, ultraviolet in there sequentially, you got much less sunburn, but it just happens a little bit more slowly, right? So it's just a cautionary tale that if you want a multi-channel UV vis, they're fast, they're cheap, they're accurate, but they can give your specimen sunburn. And there can be some inaccuracy there because um, if you, uh, Let me see how to put this. If your specimen is fluorescent, for example, uh, the ultraviolet photons can be re-emitting at, say, a visible wavelength. And that will reduce the absorbance in the visible wavelength. It can even, even give you negative absorbance at the visible wavelength, right? So which is, it's, that's an artifact, the way you're making the measurement. So anyway. There are some disadvantages and some advantages of instruments. Okie dokie. Um, should, I, should I take a poll about the, um, about sunburn? Your your um, audio is breaking up. Damn it! What about your sunburn? That's not sunburn. Yeah. Yes. So, so, um, uh, what's the sunburn? Yeah, um, a sunburn is when you uh, radiate with all wavelengths at once and you, you attack at all wavelengths at once. What happens is that the molecule, oh, shoot. 
Yeah, I can't understand you, Dr. Terra. It's, it's real bad. Ah, this is going to be a bad report. I'm going to stop my video. Yeah, it's worse than this. And then before? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, I sound like a monster. Oh, boy. My <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay, so um, uh, I have a feeling that it's not physical. I have a feeling that it's internet connections or some processing thing. One forty five. So, so those of you who have a 145, and then you know about AMOs, AMOs and regular orbitals. to some extent in my model bonding, the signal bonding, my high bonding, what orbits this? Or 
stationary states. Right? So, um, the simple molecule would not have the sigma bonds, high high bonds. I like anti bonds. This is a sigma. Like anti bonds. Now, the inflammaldehyde. It's just the CO bonds. We've got one, one sigma and then one pi bond, which are two non bonding organisms that localize to our oxygen. Yes. So, um, possible transitions include. So sigma, so sigma star, pi times pi star, and n times pi star. This manifests in a spectrum. So we see transitions oops, out of high, high energy out of low, low energy and even lower energy. Right? So um, and then, um, there's also an end to sigma star, I think, is also allowed. Okay, I got this one wrong. I'm going to So, we need to, to assign. Two transitions just by coordinating the energy.
Massimo. Um, basically, if you can and then six and eight. The 50, 40, 30, 30, numbers. And you can do these, the assignment. So, at the highest energy for sigma to sigma star, <clears throat> they are often not observed. You're back, Dr. Terrell. Oh, good. Did you change anything or did it just I fix changed nothing? I changed nothing. <laughs> I have no idea. Maybe I'm just supposed to talk less. <laughs> I wonder if it's. I wonder if it has something to do with your uh, internet connection. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly, and it's like the most expensive crap that you can get. It's an AT and T optical connection, 300 megabits. It's just weird. Flex. Flex my muscles? No, he's talking about your uh, bragging about how great your internet is. Flex my internet. <laughs> but it sucks. Anyway. So, um, basically, the Sigma Sigma star story is mostly about things we can't see. Right? It might be a very helpful wavelength range. It's just really hard to get to because at less than 200 nanometers, everything absorbs. All molecules have at least one sigma bond. So this radiation is absorbed by air and silica, and it can be done, but it's called uh, VUV, or vacuum ultraviolet, and it is super hard, super expensive. So forget about it. What we mostly see are n to pi, n to sigma star, n to pi star, and pi to pi star. Um, you know, to have an n to something, you have to have non-bonding pair, including so about oxygen and nitrogen and halogens, right? So just like generally not carbon. Um, and not hydrogen, right? So if you have a hydrocarbon, then uh, it will not have any n to sigma star type transitions. It will not have n to pi star or pi to pi star. It will only have sigma sigma star, actually. Um, uh, n to pi star and pi to pi star 
um, are strictly for molecules that are um, unsaturated, right? <clears throat> Unsaturated means, oops, oh, where'd it go? Oh, oh. Front layout, there we go. Uh, strictly for unsaturated molecules. And, um, Um, and these are the longest wavelength. They can cover, this is UV and viz, right? This is UV and viz. And they're the strongest absorbers. So 100 to 100,000 per molar, right? So th this is the realm of dyes. Do you know, uh, have you guys ever heard about Perkin? He was a, an English, uh, really almost wasn't even a chemist. He was just a, somebody who played with chemistry, I guess. And he, um, he spent a long time working on, um, actually, I don't know if he was a chemist. See, I lied again. Ah. So Perkin, he developed, um, a purple dye from coal tar, you know? And that was a huge deal because coal tar is cheap and purple dyes are rare. And so for a while, wearing purple was all the rage because it was limited to this Perkin type dye and he made a mint. And so now you can get the Perkin award for organic chemistry now, I guess. But um, let's see here. So you gotta have a pi bond to have a pi, and a pi star, or pi star, or pi to pi star. Okay, and we're gonna talk about how to distinguish these guys momentarily. But let's talk about um, what makes peaks have the shape that they do in solution, right? This should have the qualification in solution, right? So a solution phase electronic spectra, you know, these, these are very broad. And what, they, what that means is that they are the, um, uh, they are the superposition of just, trillions of individual um, like point-like spectra or, or line type spectra that come from molecules in different environments, right? So um, at any moment, let me actually, I don't think I have a good picture of this. So I can put it here. So let me just read the solution phase electronic spectra are those of molecules, as simple as solvated ions, or even large polymers. Molecules possess many electronic energy levels that almost always overlap, plus more overlapping vibrational and rotational levels. Furthermore, these levels are broadened. And what broadened means is that they continuously fluctuate due to interactions with solvent that average out over time and over the many molecules in the light beam at any moment. So um, there's basically, you know, any given molecule will have a spectrum
like that in any in any one femtosecond. Right? In that femtosecond, you can only get one photon through. So how do you know this? But in theory, right? But in practice, on average, what you actually see This is what you observe. At room temperature and in solution. Oops. This is um So, um, you know, you average this 20 trillion times. And you get this, right? And um, so this is the, this is the, the ensemble average spectrum. Nobody calls it that, but that's what it is. So um, what are the different transitions? Well, as you're already aware, there is vibrate, there are vibrational levels in, and they're complex in most molecules. There's more than one manifold like this. This is just for a diatomic. And there are electronic levels, right? This is a this is a ground electronic state. This is an upper electronic state. And um, there are rules for what transitions are observed. And there are also rules for where things start, right? Things generally start in the ground uh, vibrational level of the ground electronic state. And generally the You know, and generally there's a plus or minus one change, but then there's many manifolds and so that things get very complex very quickly, right? So this is basically a restatement of what I said on the, um, on, on this uh, foil here, which is that there are many, many complex transitions, which tend to um, average out over, uh, time and solvent interaction. So uh, here, for example, is the spectrum of this molecule here, um, uh, this methyl ether, methylphenyl ether called anisole. And um, basically um, there's, uh, there are a few different um, solvents here that this is looked at in. So for example, um, this is in water. Right. Uh, this is in um, uh, dioxane which is an ether. This is in hexane or cyclohexane. Uh, this is in perfluorooctane. And this is in the vapor phase, the gas phase, right? So you can see how um, 
let's let's look at these two bands as an example, right? First of all, even in the vapor phase, what we see are um, ensembles of rotational vibrational and electronic spectra. So there is spectral broadening contributing to this um, fairly well resolved spectrum, right? Um, <clears throat> the trouble is that as you go to higher and higher resolution here, A, it takes longer and it's, uh, it takes a, a fancier spectrometer, but the spectra become uninterpretable. They become congested with millions of lines, right? And so they're extremely hard to interpret. So there's, you know, for the human mind, there's sort of an optimal uh, spectral resolution. And um, you might say that this is probably it, like the vapor phase, maybe, um, uh, you know, one nanometer resolution, maybe 0.1 nanometers. Um, this is probably, this is, this is probably recorded. With about 0 0.1 nanometer resolution. So you get a, um, a spectrometer large enough and uh, operating in a mode that puts it at high resolution so that you can take a point every 10th nanometer and actually see a different wavelength. And, um, you know, and you don't see too much broadening over that uh, 0.1 nanometer, right? And then you can get this type of spectrum. And, um, this might be this might be roughly optimal for identification. Oops, roughly. Oh shoot. Let's say nearly optimal. But it's also kind of impractical. And so what typically one uses is a, a, a spectrum that's recorded in water or some organic solvent. You know, even cyclohexane is a little bit hard to dissolve things in. For fluorooctane, the reason that's between cyclohexane and vapor phase is that the perfluoro groups are extremely non-polarizable. You know, water is polar, dioxane is slightly polar, oops, cyclohexane is non, it is, it's non-polar, but slightly polarizable, and perfluorooctane is Nonpolar and nonpolarizable, you know, it, in practice, I mean, it's slightly polarizable, maybe. Um, and in the vapor phase, you know, there's there's no solvent at all. So you can see how, as you progress through this range of uh, solvent strengths, getting to no solvent, you see more spectral detail because on average, molecules are less distinct. So in water, There are basically, you know, millions of different solvation structures for anisole.
But in the vapor phase, there's only one. Right? So that's why, that's why you see the detail of the molecule in the vapor phase, that it tends to be washed out in water. Does that make sense? Questions? Possibly? Let's see here. Let's do a poll. In the in there it says in vapor phase. What is that one? Blank is only one structure. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. There is only one structure. Oh, there is okay. Yeah. Let me, let me. Thanks. Wait, Professor, what is? Did you say anisole? Like on, in water, anisole or? Yeah. Okay. You know, um, you know, there's there are some subtleties here, but um, basically, you know, in water there can be dipoles arranged in any one of a billion different ways around this molecule. But in the vapor phase, there's you know, there are certain broadening mechanisms, but it's essentially every molecule looks the same. then every molecule looks different. And uh, the same the same is true temporally too. So for example, if you have there there's this rhenium compound, right? at room temperature just has this broad spectrum. But if you cool it down, you can see the, the individual contributions to the, to the um, spectrum start to come out, right? And that's because um, when it's cool, then all of the um, vibrations and everything are in their ground state. And, um, so the, the spectra look much more uniform. So you could say here that comes, uh, this comes from a single structure. Let's call it solvation structure. Whereas this comes from a multitude of solvation structures. Right. And, you know, there's sort of an interesting um, space that you guys can work in, perhaps, which is the use of computers to distinguish uh, between uh, spectra of molecules. And, um, like, a computer does not know or care what each of these peaks is, right? And, but it can remember their exact wavelengths, you know, this whole string, their exact absorbances, this whole mess of properties extremely well. 
so um, that is sort of in the in the area of machine learning or you know computer identification of things. Some really interesting applications um, uh, to uh, to spectroscopy, and I, I always look into infrared spectroscopy because it's a little bit richer in detail. But uh, similar things can be done with UV vis, you know. But that, that's a research topic. It's not really a, a 155 subject. So um, let's see where are we here. Um, now let's talk about solvatochromism briefly. Um, uh, we talked about n to pi star and pi to pi star type transitions. These are common for um, unsaturated molecules, right? That's molecules with pi electrons, with pi bonds, right? And uh, there are two different types of pi star involving transitions, and, there, and that is n to pi star and pi to pi star. So obviously, for an n to pi star transition to exist, the molecule has to have an oxygen, uh, nitrogen, an oxygen, or a halogen, right? A fluorine or a chlorine, fluorine, chlor fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. Um, and if you if you take, uh, for example, uh, a ketone or an aldehyde, um, and you dissolve it in hexane, and you take the spectrum, then you dissolve it in alcohol, and you take the spectrum, and you see a shift in a particular band to the ultraviolet by about 20 nanometers, and the likelihood is that that blue shift came from uh, the stabilization of a non-bonding orbital by solvent. And you're thinking, hey, wait a minute, what's this? Why there aren't they mixing terms here? Stabilizing an electron, what an orbital? How does that work? Well, you know, there, it's all just electrostatics here, right? And so the non-bonding pair on the oxygen in, in hexane is literally at a higher energy right, than when it's in alcohol. Because in alcohol, there are, there are these groups that come and bond to it, and they, they literally tie up some of this electron density. And they lower its energy. So this can be interpreted as um, the stabilization of this non-bonding level by the by the solvent that's called um, a hypsochromism or the blue shift by polar solvents. On the other hand, if you see this a similar transition and it has a small red shift, and this may only be a few nanometers, then that is indicative of a pi to pi star transition because the pi star orbital, you know, the pi orbital is like this, whereas the pi star is, that's probably plus, minus, plus, minus, and then this is plus, minus. And these guys are more a subject to stabilization by solvent dipoles. Right? So in water, the pi star level will be stabilized slightly more than the pi level. And that will lead to a, a red shift. And then there's one last interpretive thing in uh, UV-Vis. 
which is that um, uh, we can compare, for example, one, two, three, this is a, a one, four, uh, pentene dot, uh, pentadiene, one, four pentadiene. And this is um, one, three butadiene. One comma four pentadiene and one comma three butadiene. And there's a, um, a large redshift in the pi to pi star level. Right? And that, um, that 30 nanometer, 32 nanometer redshift is because these, um, these adjacent pi bonds communicate, right? There's an atom here with a pi orbital, an atom here with a pi orbital. And so all four atoms here are um, sp2 hybrids, and they all have uh, pi bonds on them. And so, and this is, so this is what we say is a, this is due to conjugation. And then um, similarly, if you um, add a double bond uh, alpha to a carbonyl, you get a huge, an even huger uh, uh, redshift in the end of pi star level, and you can start to see a pi to pi star level. So this is also due to. Um, conjugation. Right? This is a this is considering this conjugation across molecules. But it's um uh but it's a very real effect, you know, if you consider the structures uh very similar, then you can you can look and say, oh my gosh, these these alternating double bonds are close enough to undergo um, uh, resonance, you know, there's resonance structures you can draw, and that's what will give rise to this, uh, this redder, um, uh, this smaller pi pi star gap. Mm -hmm. All right, so, um, you know, lastly, you can also correlate um, make some interesting uh, conjectures about the, um, uh, the uh, these are all the B bands in um, the, uh, the, so these are all the pi pi star bands in the, in the ring of benzene. You see with benzene, this is uh, about 256 nanometers. If you add a phenol here, it redshifts to 270, which indicates that this, um, this uh, oxygen here becomes partly sp2, right? And it participates in the ring a little bit, so it lowers the pi star levels. The phenolate ion that can't happen. Oh no, I'm sorry, in the phenolate ion that happens even more, actually. Right? And in the and in the uh, amine, it also happens, right? That this lone pair gets tied up with the pi system, and that tends to redshift this band. It, it, it lowers the gap between pi and pi star. However, if you protonate it, that it actually uh, blue shifts all the way back to the uh, uh, region where um, uh, the um, the pure benzene 
uh, Pi Pi star transition is. So anyhow, this is all, this is good for today, I think, folks. And I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, uh, end the, the long, boring lecture here. And I will, um, I will see uh, the Thursday folks for lab at 10 a.m. And then um, I actually have a, um, I have to do a peer review at 12. So I'm going to be late for office hours today between 12.30 and 1.30, but I will, I will be there. Okie dokie, folks. Just so you know, Dr. Terrell, the um, email we got said that lab starts at 10 p.m. I don't know if that makes oh, sense. Shit. I'm so sorry. I'm going to fix that right away. 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Okay. Ah. We'll see you in an hour, Dr. Terrell. Okay, see you in an hour. Bye-bye, everybody. Um, wait, is this for a Thursday lab? Thursday lab, yes. Okay. And anybody's welcome to join. It's just I'm just going to blab on about the um, UV Viz problem. Hey, bye, Dr. Terrell. Bye. Bye, Dr. T. Bye-bye. Thanks for, thanks for coming.